The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, fellow wanderers, to the places our minds wander. Where strange lights speed beyond reason across a clear night sky. The house at the end of the road where disembodied voices whisper and strange noises make the living shiver. Lurking shadows hiding on the edge of the woods just outside your back door. Odd true events throughout time that lead you down the rabbit hole. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And this is where our minds wander. Hello and welcome to Our Minds Wander, all you fellow wanderers. I'm Wes, and that's my wife and co-host, Beth. Hello, everyone. So, Beth, I've been excited all week to record this episode. You have? Yes. You know, we have listener stories, and I found a peculiar story that I can't wait to share with our listeners. You know, I'm excited, too, especially about our listener stories. But what's this peculiar tale you're going to share with us first? Well. What if you heard these statements coming from within your farmhouse walls? I shall haunt you with weird noises and clanking chains. I am a freak. I have hands and feet. And if you ever saw me, you would be paralyzed, petrified, mummified, turned into a pillar of salt. Okay. I am the fifth dimension. I am the eighth wonder of the world. I can split the atom. I am an extra clever mongoose. (laughs) A a talking mongoose. Yeah. I'm talking about Jeff, the talking mongoose. (laughs) Who reportedly haunted the Irving family in their stone farmhouse on the Isle of Man in the 1930s. So... James and Margaret Irving moved to the Isle of Man, which is between Britain and Ireland, in 1917. James had been a businessman, but due to financial issues, he decided to try his luck at farming. They purchased a rather isolated stone farmhouse that sat on a hillside. It had no electricity or telephone, and it was lit with petroleum lamps. The nearest village was two miles away. Ah, so the whole no-one-can-hear-you-scream thing. Well, that certainly would be true in this case, yes. A little while after the Irvings moved into the farmhouse, their daughter Vara was born. None of the Irvings had any paranormal things happen to them in the farmhouse for over a decade, although there is one rumor that James hired some workmen to do some renovations before they moved in. The workmen were supposed to spend the night in the house, because it was easier than traveling home each day. But the workmen left the first night because they were spooked by a dark feeling inside the house. It wasn't until 1931 when Vara went out rabbit hunting, and that's kind of when things seemed to change. The 12-year-old girl was shocked to find several dead rabbits neatly waiting for her. Oh, well, that seems rather helpful, doesn't it? Well, it certainly does. But I think I'd be asking myself what or who could have done it and why. Soon after discovering the rabbits, the Irvings began to hear strange noises in their home. Sometimes a low growling, sometimes a spitting sound, and sometimes a sharp bark. Occasionally it sounded as if a baby were crying, and James assumed that the odd creature that he had spotted outside the home had somehow made its way inside their walls. He had seen an animal that kind of looked like a weasel or a weasel-like creature lurking around the house. On another occasion, he saw what he thought was a cat that was striped like a tiger on the property. But when he went after it, it entered some tall grass and seemingly disappeared. These odd noises went on for quite a while, and James, annoyed by them, decided one evening to make some noises back. He growled and barked, 
The creature, whatever it was, mimicked him perfectly. Vara, I suppose, was intrigued by the animal living inside their walls, and she began reciting nursery rhymes to Jeff, and the little clever mongoose was eventually able to recite them back in a high-pitched voice. The family began referring to the creature as Jack, except the creature took offense to that and informed them that his name was Jeff. He also corrected their misconception that he was some sort of weasel creature by allegedly informing them that he was an extra clever mongoose born in Delhi, India in 1852. Yeah, I've heard that about talking mongooses. They get very touchy when, you know, you call them weasels. Jeff would follow the family to the market, but always stayed out of sight, behind the hedges. Jeff would hang on to the undercarriage of buses and observe what the town folks were doing, even as far as 20 miles away, then report back to the Irvings later on. His jaunts were ended, though, when a bus depot electrician installed an electrified plate under one of the buses in an attempt to kill off the animal. Oh, no. Why would he do that? I'm going to get to that in a bit. Okay. When James heard about the electrified plate, and tried to warn Jeff, the clever mongoose replied, Oh, I know all about it. It's under bus 81. Wow. And he wasn't wrong. (laughs) When James went back to the depot to confirm which bus it was, it was bus 81. Okay, that's, that's really crossing the line into, like, creepy town. Did any of them actually see this thing inside their house? Yes, actually they did. James described Jeff as being about nine inches long, with golden yellow fur and a bushy tail with black spots. But at other times, the family felt like he was uh, the size of a small cat. Hmm. He liked to stay in this little alcove in Vara's room, and I guess at one point they saw one of his paws as he was taking food they left for him. They would leave him biscuits, chocolate, bacon, and bananas. He scratched Margaret once and allegedly told her to put some ointment on it. <laughs> well, <clears throat> he, he was a very helpful mongoose. <laughs> that he was. For the most part, Jeff took on the role of house pet with special abilities. He would guard the house and let the Irvings know when guests were arriving. Jeff would also warn them that one of them had left the fire going unattended and he would go down and put it out for them, which he did. So he was very, very helpful in addition to being able to talk. That he was. He also liked to sing along to the gramophone, the only entertainment that the Irvings had, and not just in English. He also liked Spanish folk songs. His favorite record was Carolina Moon, and he was quite good at singing the Manx National Anthem, which is the national anthem of the Isle of Man. When asked exactly what he was, Jeff told them that he was an earthbound spirit and a ghost in the form of a mongoose. However, he also warned them that he was extra, extra clever, but not always kind. Uh And he wasn't kind when he wasn't pleased. Apparently, he once told them, I have been to nicer homes than this. Carpets, piano, satin covers on the polished tables. I am going back there, (laughs) ha ha. He also, on at least one occasion, referred to James as a fat-headed gnome. (laughs) Well then, I guess he was a gnomophobe. Concerned that this odd and somewhat disturbing situation had gone on for far too long and that Jeff was too attached to Vara, James decided that he had had enough. Jeff preferred to hide in Vara's room in an alcove in the rafters, but the fact that Jeff also liked to watch his wife undress each night and call out the names of each piece of clothing she took off probably didn't sit too well with him either. Jeez! A nomophobe and a voyeur. Well, no matter what kind of form or body this thing has taken on, he's still a male, and I imagine seeing a female undressing kind of got him excited. (laughs) 
I think it would have been pretty funny, though, if he had hummed like a striptease <laughs> tune while she undressed. Jeez. But that's just me. <laughs> In his little high-pitched mongoose voice. <laughs> that would have been the icing on the cake for me. <laughs> James set out to rid his home of the talking mongoose. He put out rat poison and kept his hunting rifle nearby. Jeff didn't exactly want to leave, and upon sensing his human host negative feelings against him, Jeff began terrorizing the family, thumping in the walls, screeching obscenities, throwing rocks, and eventually telling him, if you are kind to me, I will give you good luck. If you are not kind, I shall kill all your poultry. I could kill you all if I liked, but I won't. Wow. Vindictive little thing, wasn't he? So at this point, did the family still think that Jeff was an actual talking mongoose, or did they think he really was an earthbound spirit trapped inside the mongoose body? Huh. Good question. And it sounds like they changed their minds. Initially, it did seem like they believed Jeff was an actual talking mongoose. That Vara had somehow taught it to speak. But as time went on, and through some of the things that Jeff allegedly said to them, or when he'd sing racy versions of Home on the Range, they might have... <laughs> yep. <laughs> racy versions <laughs> Of Home on the Range. I don't know how you make it racy, but I guess he was a very clever mongoose. I guess he was. So they may have come to the conclusion that there was something else going on. Right. When asked once if he was a poltergeist, Jeff apparently said that he was not, but that he was an Indian familiar. Oh. Familiars are generally associated with witchcraft. A witch might have a familiar in the form of a cat or a toad, you know, that kind of thing. And they were generally considered to be demonic in our culture, but I don't know how familiars um, figure into the Indian folklore and culture. Yeah, I don't either. That's interesting, though. But the Irvings decided that keeping Jeff happy was the best bet, and soon other town folks knew he existed. Once when three fishermen stopped by to visit, one of them stopped talking because he said a white cat jumped into his lap. Except no one else could see any cat and the Irvings didn't have a cat. Also, a road repairman had a rather eerie experience while walking near the farm too. He claimed that during his lunch break, he threw a bit of his leftover bread into the grass and then watched as the bread seemed to move all by itself. Hmm. Soon enough, the tabloid media heard about Jeff and ran several articles about him. Locals were interviewed, and in one, a bus driver expressed his contempt for Jeff, claiming Jeff knew a darn sight too much about the townsfolk. The bus driver went on to say that his dinner, six sandwiches wrapped in a brown paper bag, had been slit open by sharp claws and stolen. He stated, I'd like to get my hands on that, Jeff. Aha, uh-huh. so maybe he was the one that put the electrified plate under the bus because Jeff stole his dinner and had gossiped about him a little too much. Yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Aha. Uh-huh. Once the news really got out, psychics and other people who were just curious to see things for themselves paid visits to the Irving farm in the hopes of hearing or seeing Jeff. Many believed in him, and many did not. Perhaps to put an end to the speculation once and for all, James Irving wrote to Harry Price, a known psychic investigator in 1932. Price is often considered the original psychic investigator. Hmm. Anyway, Price sent a colleague, Harold Dennis, to check out the claims. Dennis examined the hair samples, made cast of just paw prints and teeth marks. The hair was sent to the Zoological Society, and the results came back that the hair was from the family's dog. Oh. But the paw print cast and teeth impressions did not belong to any known animal, including a mongoose. Huh. While he was there, 
Dennis did witness some tremendous noises, including crashes and banging and thumping that seemed to travel throughout the entire length of the second floor of the house. Vara, who was the only one upstairs, seemed completely unconcerned and said it was Jeff up to his usual tricks. But Dennis also pointed out that the acoustics in the stone farmhouse made the entire place sound like an echo chamber and that perhaps a family member was responsible for Jeff's voice and noises. Well, that's interesting since she was the only one upstairs, right, by herself when all these noises were happening. And then she was like, oh, it was just Jeff. Well, that's what he states. Yeah, interesting. Dennis and Price were never able to fully confirm or deny the existence of Jeff. But they did suggest the idea that the haunting was more psychological in nature and that it needed further investigation. In other words, perhaps it was a case of mass hysteria or perhaps someone living in the house that had manifested a poltergeist. Gotcha. It's kind of obvious that a lot of Jeff's interactions centered on Vara. She was 12 when the incidents began, which tends to be the age that many paranormal experts believe poltergeist activity began. And Jeff did seem to latch on to her more than the others. His favorite spot was her room, and she was the one credited with teaching him to talk, you know, by reciting those nursery rhymes. Right. She was the one alone upstairs when Dennis witnessed all the crashing and loud noises coming from over his head. Right. But others proposed that the poltergeist came from James. Farming in the Isle of Man is no walk in the park, and the stress of the unforgiving climate and landscape may have caused him more inner turmoil than he'd ever let on. He was the first one to see the creature outside. True. There's always the possibility that the entire thing was a hoax. Dennis pointed out that the house was pretty echoey. Maybe the family planned out who was going to do what and at which times, while visitors were present, you know, to try to prove Jeff was real. It was even suggested that Vara was a gifted ventriloquist. Some experts suggested that the teeth marks and paw prints were made with sticks. But the question would be, why? What did they gain from it? other than a little attention from the media. Regardless, Margaret and Vara left the farmhouse in 1945 after James' death. Jeff, it seems, did not follow them, nor did he reappear when the new owners moved in. Hmm. Or did he? Hmm. In 1946, the new owner, actor Leslie Graham, claimed to have shot Jeff, but this animal had black and white fur. When she saw the pictures, Vara insisted that whatever the animal was, it was not Jeff. A few years later, the Graham family left the property and the farmhouse was demolished. To her credit, Vara maintained until her death in 2005 that Jeff was real and that it all truly happened. That is interesting. That it is. Wow, it's very bell witchy kind of but in mongoose form, you know, where the whole family is experiencing something and other people are hearing it and witnessing it too. But I don't know. Talking mongoose, man, that's creepy. (laughs) I want a talking mongoose. (laughs) You just want one to hum striptease songs. (laughs) That's exactly what I want them for. (laughs) Hey, did you know? George Washington was almost Frankenstein. Washington's friend, Dr. William Thornton, was convinced that reanimation of the dead president was totally possible with cutting-edge science. Since George had only been dead for three days, he wanted to put Washington in an ice bath, perform a tracheotomy, then infuse him with lamb's blood, which he was sure would do the trick. Luckily, Dr. Thornton was denied the opportunity. Who'd have thunk it? So 
So, Beth, I know that you're going to share some listener stories with us tonight. I am. We so, have, who are we starting with? We have a couple really good ones. Our first story comes from Jessica in New York. She wrote, My college roommate and I like to live on the edge, I think. There are several stories with her that end in creepy encounters. This one involved us driving from campus, about 20 minutes away, to a spot called Aw Sable Chasm. It's a beautiful, popular tourist attraction. There is a beautiful waterfall you can enjoy from the bridge. Aw Sable Chasm is known for its tunnels and caves, and the Aw Sable River runs through it and into Lake Champlain. At the time, I was dating a very creepy man who proclaimed himself to be a vampire. When my roommate and I got to the chasm, we parked the car and walked to the center of the bridge to listen to the waterfall. It was nighttime and very, very dark. Exceptionally dark. I don't remember the stars being out or the moon. As we stood there in the pitch dark, all we could hear was the rushing water. I stood on the bottom rung of the railing, and for some reason, as I stood there, I remember feeling eyes watching me. Like, from Dracula, just eyes leering at me. We didn't stay very long and ran back to the car. There wasn't much conversation on the way back to the dorm. I think we were both too freaked out. Once we got back to the dorm is when we each spilled the beans about what we had experienced. She said that as we walked towards the bridge overlooking the waterfall, she kept feeling as if someone was watching us. She couldn't shake the feeling that someone was there in the shadows. Then, when I stood up on the railing, looking into the dark void, she saw me fall in. She had this vision of rescue helicopters and flashing lights. Overwhelmed by it, she said that was why she said we should head back to the car. I told her that when I was standing there at the railing, I felt like I had no future. I think the feeling of being watched was so overwhelming and crushing that I just felt at the time like I had no future. I do remember feeling like the eyes followed us all the way back to campus. Needless to say, I didn't stay with the self-proclaimed vampire, as I was convinced he had eyes in the sky. This was by far the creepiest experience I've had, but I was glad I had my roommate to share it with. So, our second story comes from a listener in Pennsylvania. He titled it, A Visit to Cooperstown. My wife and I and our young teenage daughter were on the New York Thruway returning home from a summer vacation trip. We had been driving for hours. It was late afternoon and we still had a ways to go, so we decided to stop somewhere for the night. We were approaching Cooperstown, a place we had always wanted to visit. We pulled off there but soon found that all the hotels were fully booked. So were the first two B&Bs we visited. The owner of the second said he had a friend, a B&B owner, who was about to reopen after being closed for a while and who might be willing to accommodate us. We were in luck, he agreed. The plan was to visit, select our rooms, and go out to eat while they prepared them. We selected a double room and a small single room on the second floor. However, we hadn't noticed our daughter was very agitated, and as soon as we left, she informed us that there was no way she was going to stay there. That house is haunted. I must admit, at that time, I did not believe in ghosts and was not too sympathetic. Anyway, we did convince her to stay with an agreement that she would sleep in the double room with her mother and I would stay in the single. I did not experience any strange sounds and slept soundly all night. They, on the other hand, had heard scary noises from the th third floor all night and hadn't slept at all. They did admit they had blocked the door with a chair and neither had left the room to visit the bathroom, which was down the hall. It hadn't helped that we were the only guests. As we were walking down the stairs for breakfast, our daughter noticed a large plaque on the wall that told the story of the young woman who had committed suicide on the third floor and whose ghost was said to haunt the building. Yikes. That is creepy. <laughs> our daughter was vindicated, she said. 
I don't know if you, I don't know if I would want to be. <laughs> At breakfast, the owner told us it was true. Her ghost was very active and was well known. People actually stayed there hoping for an encounter, which they often experienced. He said he and his wife made a practice of meeting their guests on their porch to make sure they were aware of this. One guest said he knew because the ghost had followed them out of the house. It's a good thing he hadn't greeted us like that. <laughs> What a good story. That is an excellent story. I love when people have feelings about things and then, you know, it turns out to be True. to be accurate. Right. You know, I think there's something to be said for intuition and and you know, just knowing certain things. That there is. Have you uh, ever been to a spot that you felt was like inherently creepy or spooky? Yeah, it's happened to me a few times. I mean, I've gotten some weird vibes from from places for sure. On a trip to Rome once, I went to the Colosseum and it was like the one place other than the Roman Forum that I was looking forward to more than anything. I was super excited to go and I look forward to it the whole trip. But when we got there and I went inside and uh, I was looking down onto the arena part where they would actually have their um, battles. Yeah. I had this completely overwhelming sense of just utter sadness and dread almost. And I kept like looking away and looking back and it wouldn't go away. And it was so overwhelming that I actually had to leave. And I stood outside until everybody else was was done seeing what they wanted to see. That was a strange experience. That is strange. Yeah. Well, thank you again to Jessica and the listener from Pennsylvania who sent us the stories. They were great. They were. And I always mean to say, I know I'm not very good about remembering to say this, But if you'd like to know more about the topics that we cover in each episode, you can always check out the links to where we got our info in our show notes. They're in every show, but I'm very bad at remembering to say that. Yes, you are. <laughs> well, I guess that about wraps it up for this episode, all you wanders. Um, thank you for joining us again. And we will see you next week for an all new episode of Where Our Minds Wander. See you soon. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to traveling with you again to the places where our minds wander. If you like what you heard, please take a moment and provide us with a five-star rating and a comment. It really helps us move up the list so people can find us. See you next week for an all-new episode of Where Our Minds Wander. Wander.